Please welcome to the stage, Senior Vice President, Software Development, Wim Cokart. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, for, thanks for joining this morning's session. Um, we're going to talk about infrastructure. There's another speaker, Ali Elasti, a, a, a good friend and colleague of mine who is a wonderful speaker. So he'll take the second part and talk a little bit more about the hardware side. I'm more the software guy, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what we're doing in terms of software infrastructure, software that we provide to customers, but also what we use inside Oracle Cloud as well. So thanks for coming. This is day three of three of Open World, so we're almost, um, almost at the end. I hope it's been a great show for everyone. And uh, quickly, the safe harbor statement. <clears throat> anyway, so, you know, a lot of Open World talks this year have been about cloud, right? Everyone that goes and attends sessions, we talk about the cloud service that we're providing, the, the expansion of cloud. When Larry talked about <clears throat> his, in his keynote on Monday about autonomous database and moving towards autonomous infrastructure and cloud as well. Now, of course, we also have a lot of um, customers, most customers that have a huge on-premises environment as well. And you run software, you run an operating system, you run hardware. And how does that match with what we're doing um, in Oracle Cloud? Now, one of the themes that you'll see or hear throughout this presentation, both from myself and Ali later on the hardware side, is that we're a little bit unique in terms of being a cloud vendor. That is, the hardware we use, the software we use as an operating system, and the infrastructure piece, the virtualization layer, all that stuff is exactly the same as what we provide to our customers on premises. And that sets us apart from other companies like Amazon with AWS, Microsoft with Azure, because you don't know what they run. When you run a VM in AWS, it runs on some hypervisor, on some piece of hardware, but it's an opaque box. We're actually quite open about what we run. We, we know exactly what the hardware is. We show that to you. Um, the operating system that we run is something that you can run, can, you can run as well. It's nice from an engineering team, um, a group um, point of view because um, I have a, or my team has a huge, huge QA area, which is Oracle Cloud and Oracle Engineered Systems as we're doing development. We do a lot of bug fixes and that goes into our product and goes to our customers as well. So a lot of stuff you hear about cloud actually then translates to on-premises. Another thing that Larry mentioned was autonomous database coming to on-premises with Exadata Gen 2. He mentioned that on Monday. Same thing. We have this in our cloud. We do all the work for automation, security, patching, everything else. And we know that lots of customers want this on-premises. So we take that software stack and hardware stack and provide it on-premises as well. So it gives us choice and it gives us the ability to do all of this machine learning that we do in, at large scale. We can provide it to a smaller scale on the customer side as well. And I think here we're also a little bit unique compared to anyone else in this industry. So from an operating system point of view, and so infrastructure, of course, starts on the top layer is operating system, virtualization layer, you know, firmware and so forth down to, down to the hardware. And so from the software point of view, Oracle Linux is the main operating system that we use um, in Oracle Cloud. We've been working on this, you know, about 20 years, I hear on Monday. Um, it's true, it's about 20 years that we, that we started um, working on Linux. First, having Oracle software ported and so forth. But then in 2006, we had here at Open World, in 2006, we had a big launch where we said, hey, we, Oracle, are going to provide an operating system to our customers. Linux is important. Uh, Oracle database running really well on that platform is important, and the only way we can really do that and feel very confident is to have the whole stack. This then translated into Exadata a few years later, where we also controlled the whole stack. And it's the only way to be able to, to do testing at scale and also to make sure we can do all the performance enhancements we need and, and so forth. So we've been in, in the Linux business for, for a very long time. More recently, a lot of the focus is on cloud native. We joined CNCF. Uh, we're a member of, of this new recently announced uh, confidential computing consortium as well. So we're doing a lot of stuff in the security space, upstream open source, but also just in general on the cloud native side. Within Oracle, we use Linux, as you can see, everywhere. Right? We, we run our cloud on Oracle Linux. 
every single server that we deploy, every service that customers use. And this is an interesting concept here, right? When you use autonomous database, you don't really know. It's, you use the database itself. There actually is a, an operating system running underneath. You just don't have to worry about it. We automatically patch it for you. We automatically do all that stuff. And people are no longer really aware that, hey, there's actually an operating system running under all of these services, whether you use DNS or file system service or object storage. There's an OS underneath. Right? And so we use that for everything. We run our own applications on it. So within Oracle, we're a consumer of this software as well. The same stuff as that we provide to our customers. Um, it's probably the most pervasive piece of software that we run within the company as far as, as far as I can tell. The other part where we use this a lot is in engineer systems. Exadata, whether this Exadata Cloud a customer or normal Exadata, uh, PCA, um, the database appliance and so forth. So all that stuff uses the same operating system. And the, the, the tagline here is we run the same OS as our customers. Again, we're quite unique in this But more than an operating system, we actually also provide a virtualization layer. We were very much engaged in doing container work. Uh, we're, we're in CNCF, where we do a lot of work around Kubernetes. Um, and then, of course, the uh, autonomous operations as part of autonomous Linux. All of this stuff is actually included in the operating system that we provide. And there's two ways to get that. One is, if you're in Oracle Cloud and use Oracle Linux, we actually don't charge you for it. You get all this stuff that I talk about included with the compute. There's no extra additional cost. On premises, we have a very simple support subscription, and all of this is included. There's no menu of things to, to pick and choose from. It's just all included in a very simple support subscription. And the software itself is completely free, both binaries and source code. A little bit about KVM. So for a long time, we have used Zen as the hypervisor in a product called Oracle VM. We still use that today, and, and uh, many customers use Zen. Um, Exadata um, systems use Zen as the hypervisor. But we've also realized that um, new innovation happens much faster in, in a hypervisor called KVM, or it's really Linux that's the hypervisor with, with KVM as a module that, that provides the, the virtualization technology. And so we have standardized on KVM ourselves going forward. Our current Cloud Gen 2 is all working on KVM. The most recent released Exadata that was launched on Monday, Exadata X8M, I believe is the, the name, is also using KVM uh, as a hypervisor going forward. <coughs> And so it works really well. It's very secure. Um, and uh, that's part of Oracle Linux for customers on premises as well. We have a, a manager product called Overt, uh, Oracle Virtualization Manager. It's, op it's an open source project that, that's called Overt that we, that we include. That's also part of it. And we also support Windows and, and other Linux operating systems as well. So it's a general purpose hypervisor. And it's the exact same one that we use inside Oracle Cloud. <coughs> In terms of security, you know, one thing, one thing that really helps us again is um, we have FedRAMP certifications for Oracle Cloud. We have to do all these, these certification projects to, to ensure we can run government business. That requires us to do FIPS certification, requires us to do common criteria or protection profiles. And all the work we do for, for this on the Oracle Cloud side is then for the general Linux operating system that we can provide to customers. So as we provide Oracle Linux 7, we have OpenSSL with FIPS certification, FIPS 140-2. We have uh, EAL certification and all that stuff. So all the, all the certification work that sometimes banks require or, or uh, uh, health institutions or, or just in general governments um, are, are included with this. There's a lot of security auditing that happens here. Um, we have a lot of processes in place within the company to ensure that nobody else can access our source control. And this is very, uh, it's very valuable for, for us and, and others. A little bit later, I'll talk a little bit about case splice as well, which is a technology we use to do security patching. And we have some, some really interesting IP in, in that space. The final thing on this slide that I wanted to point out is um, we're a member of, of uh, you know, the Linux pre-embargo security team. What that means is that there's many Linux distributions, right? There's Red Hat, SUSE, um, Ubuntu, Oracle Linux, and so forth. And in order, if, a, if a security vulnerability is found in one distribution or somewhere in Linux, then we all coordinate this to ensure that one distribution vendor doesn't release something before the other one. And if you're a customer of the other one, you're kind of 
um, caught by surprise. So we have this private group of people that always communicate about every single security vulnerability, not just on the Linux kernel, but also other libraries like glibc and OpenSSL and Apache and so forth. So we all agree on a date that we feel we can, we can address this issue, and then when that date hits, then we make it publicly available. So there's a lot of coordination within the Linux community on this. Um, I think that the Spectre meltdown vulnerabilities that hit about now a year and a half ago um, really contributed to the hardware vendors being more in tune with the Linux community as well because the hardware vendor found something that really required an OS fix and they ended up only selectively choosing some of the vendors to notify and there was a lot of last minute scramble to get everyone together. So that was a good sort of wake up call for a, a set of vulnerabilities that were um, sort of new. We never really ha had these particular types of CPU bugs hit us on the operating system side, but even that has been really smoothened out over the last uh, about two years. Um, cloud native. So, of course, cloud native is very popular. Um, a lot of new development happens in this model where in, in many ways, operating systems, again, are becoming sort of a commodity or, or it's just a bunch of libraries. People just want to deploy their application. They don't want to create a VM, install an OS, install the app, just want to create a container, ship it, and, and, and deploy it. Kubernetes is, is uh, the most popular um, framework for, for doing uh, orchestration engine, for, for doing um, container deployment right now. Docker was sort of a standalone piece of technology that let you create and run containers. Then Kubernetes came up and said, hey, we, we can create a, a large pool of servers and pods, and then you can use that to, to distribute the microservices. So we have a complete Kubernetes-based um, cloud-native environment. So we follow the upstream project CNCF, and we curate the modules that are very popular. And one thing to keep in mind is that in, in the open source world, you know, projects can be very hip and popular for a period of time, and then suddenly there's friction within the community and it can fall apart, right? And so when you look at Kubernetes, you know, it's a very popular project and it's, it seems long-term very stable. There's a lot of other modules that come up, and then one of the things we, we, we do as part of this curation is we look at the sentiment on the mail list, which might sound funny, but actually is important, and we see whether people can work together, um, whether there's a lot of disagreements, and if there are disagreements, whether they can get resolved easily, or people are willing to make that happen, and it's not too competitive. And if the sentiment is positive, there's a lot of commits happening, there's a lot of contributors, then we take that module and we provide it as part of the stack. So we have components for provisioning, for the runtime itself. Um, we allow people to use Kata containers, as an example. Um, orchestration management, you know, we support Helm and Helm charts. Istio is in the packet. So there's a whole set of modules that make it easy for anyone to start using Kubernetes and, and create a cloud native environment. Another part of, of uh, using Kubernetes and, and our strategy in this is that we are not um, customizing it we're fixing bugs, we're packaging it, making sure it's the right modules, but we're not making this into the Oracle-specific, um, unique version of Kubernetes. Some other vendors really make it something that's slightly different, and the problem is that once you start going that direction, you're stuck with it, right? You can't go back. And when, often when I talk to customers, the way I explain it is, if you take your developers and you send them to KubeCon, which is the Kubernetes conference, then they learn a lot of cool stuff in talks, but well, they can come back, use Oracle Kubernetes, and they can just use it. That's not the case with some of our competitors because they make complete changes and it makes it very proprietary in that space. So our direction here is we provide standard Kubernetes, we make sure it's well, well tested, it, it uh, has an easy installer for upgrades and, and patching and so forth. <clears throat> so Monday was a, a very exciting keynote. Uh, <laughs> Larry announced autonomous Linux, and and you know to sort of recap what the way the way this happened, um, you know we started with autonomous database in the last two years. It's a very successful service. It's very easy to use. I want a database. All I do is I push a button and I log into my database and I run SQL. Everything around it is taken care of automatically. We patch it for you. We upgrade it for you. We apply security fixes for you. Uh, we tune it for you. You don't even have to worry about indexes anymore. You do a lot of SQL statements and queries on tables, and our own code says, oh, an index on this table and this column might actually make things faster, and off you go. 
right? So as a database developer, you don't have to go ask the DBA admin to, to go and apply a fix. You don't have to worry about getting an email saying, oh, we're gonna bring the database down for updates on Friday at five o'clock, and you're in the middle of something, so you know, scramble or drop the work you do. And so autonomous database really takes care of all that stuff around you. Don't worry about it. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is there's an OS underneath, obviously. That's Oracle Linux. So during all that time with autonomous database, we've been doing that for the OS as well. You just don't see it, right? We patch the operating system for you. We apply security vulnerability fixes. We do critical bug fixes underneath autonomous database. And everyone just uses it. So what we said internally was, well, there's other services that might want to use that same model for their own thing, whether it's a customer or internal use, or developers say, that, that say, hey, we don't want to worry about the operating system anymore, just, just let it do its thing. And so the reason we launched Autonomous Linux is exactly for that reason. So now anyone that wants to deploy an application pushes a button, they get an OS, they log in to install the app, and they don't have to worry about it. If you're a developer, you start something new, it's current and secure. In three months or six months, it's still current and secure, right? And security is really important to us. It's the number one thing at the company, right? Our customer data is in our cloud, so we do everything to make that secure. And the operating system is a big part of that. Um, one of the things that we've learned over time, both internally as, as our own users for many years and also customers is that the model of patching on the operating system is still based on a new version comes out, it takes three months of testing, there's planned downtime. It's more a project management thing than anything else. Bring the middle tier down, then bring the database down, then patch the system, reboot it, hope it actually comes back up after reboot, restart the database, restart the middle tier. It takes days. This, you don't have to worry about it. Just keep running, All right? So it saves a lot of time and money and you can focus on the higher level tasks that you need to do. We do automatic provisioning. It's integrated in Oracle Cloud for scaling and tuning. We do a lot of patching work, which, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute as well. And we can do analytics at scale. That's really ultimately what it comes down to. So in terms of patching, um, we use case supplies as a technology, and case supplies is a term we use for being able to apply critical bug fixes and security fixes on the kernel at runtime. So your application is running, the database is running, it doesn't matter what it is, and we patch the system. It's actually applied and running, and there's an eight millisecond, or microsecond, not millisecond, eight microseconds um, of, a, of a hang, so to speak, where we apply that patch and, and continue. So basically nobody notices it. Right. Um, one of the things that we introduced a few months ago, uh, which we call exploit detection, is, is related to this. So, to give you an idea, so security vulnerabilities, in some cases, have a very specific signature. Right. There's a bug in the Linux kernel, and if you do this particular pattern, then you get into the kernel or you can find a, a loophole. Now, when that's the case, when we fix the vulnerability, we also add little pieces of code that check for that trigger, that create a trigger for that particular pattern to be hit. So a machine is running, we fix it. If somebody were to be logged into that machine and tries to abuse that vulnerability, we will actually create an audit record. We will say this process ID with this process name at this time was trying to abuse CVE 2019-20, something like that. Then we trap that from a logging point of view and we can notify the customer with an event saying, this server in this subnet here, somebody is logging in there or is, has been logged in there trying to get into your system, right? And it's a little bit different from, oh, I'm just, I'm fixed, which is great, but if somebody is running around on your machine trying to find a hole, you would want to know that too, right? So this allows us and our customers to be notified when somebody is, is uh, trying to find something on a system that is already patched. You do want to know that. <clears throat> so case supplies is, is what is used for this. Case supplies is available to everyone. It's part of Oracle Linux on premises and, and, and in our cloud, and, and this is what we use internally. Um, we can patch the kernel, but we can also patch user space. So glibc, OpenSSL, QMU or is a library that, that we can patch while the system is running. And this is another important piece that I wanted to point out. Um, a few years ago, I think it's four years ago by now, there was a, a open SSL vulnerability which was called Hardbleed. 
And this had a huge impact worldwide, right? This crypto library um, was, you know, was, it was called hardly this bug. And, and in, order to, uh, in order to fix it, you had to install a new library. The only way that applications use the new library is by shutting down your web server and anything that used it. So the whole world basically rebooted every server on the planet, right? With Case Plus, we can patch that online. Your web server's running, we can actually provide that. If it were to happen now, we can provide a hard bleed bug fix online. No restarting your web server. That's all part of autonomous Linux. So we really have the ability to protect a large set of the critical components of an operating system and do it in an online fashion. It comes back to, I'm a developer or I'm a, an admin that needs to run an application. Don't worry about the operating system. Let us handle it. Very simple. <clears throat> um, reducing downtime. So um, if we look at how much downtime there, there, there could be, it comes down to less than 2.5 minutes per month. So we hit the uh, 99995 availability for, um, for, for eliminating, I guess, eliminating human errors. Everything keeps happening online. <clears throat> um, part of doing an autonomous operating system is also the management piece where we can do um, analytics and so forth. So an another thing we launched, another service we launched this week is called the OS Management Service in Oracle Cloud. Um, the OS Management Service basically lets you create repositories for packages, it lets you register systems and groups, and um, it collects data from a running operating system, not just autonomous Linux, any Linux OS, and we, we, we uh, plan to introduce support for Windows as well over time. And it, it, so we know what's running on our server, and then we can say, you know, this machine is not compliant, it doesn't have these patches installed, or this server is out of date compared to your, your default model, your, your gold standard, so it la lets you do a lot of configuration management and compliance and auditing work. And we use this service also to collect log files, uh, telemetry data, metrics from a running system. And the way we do tuning in the autonomous, uh, in, into, in autonomous Linux is by looking at network traffic, looking at how disk I.O. happens, uh, looking at the patterns of work that happen on an operating system. And then we can send a message down to the OS to change. Um, one example could be we're doing a lot of, you're doing, in one VM, you're doing a lot of network I.O. Over the, over the internet. For instance, you're sending video to someplace. Well, in the Linux kernel, there are very fine tuning parameters for algorithms that would make that happen at 10% improved rate, right? Most people don't even know that these algorithms exist in the kernel. But we detect that, we see the pattern of type of network IO that happens, so we can send a message to the Linux kernel saying, change the congestion algorithm used for TCP IP to BBR. And suddenly your performance goes up by 10%. That might only be needed for that one particular VM. The other ones do different traffic. So we can really customize each, each OS environment based on that. If you have to do that as an individual in a, in, a, in a company, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of detailed knowledge that you have to, have to gain to do this. It's the same with the database and automatic index creation and other things. We see patterns. Each system is slightly different, and that's OK. We take care of that for you. Um, this is just a screenshot of what it looks like. I don't have to spend too much time on that one. <clears throat> uh, so this all costs less. One is it's included itself. So auto autonomous Linux is included in Oracle Cloud. OS support is included. However, you save a lot of time and money on sysadmin pieces. You don't have to do all that mundane work. You can focus on higher level stuff. So that's a real cost saving right there that, that also needs to be included. <clears throat> So with that, so we have on-premises, um, you know, we provide hardware and software there. We have cloud at customer, which brings a lot of the cloud innovation with autonomous database, autonomous Linux, all packaged together into an on-premises system for folks that don't want to move to cloud. And then, of course, we have all this stuff inside Oracle Cloud as well. And with that, I'm going to introduce Ali Alasti, who is a, a dear friend and a wonderful colleague and is an awesome speaker, so you're in great hands, so thank you. My name is Ali Alasti. Uh, my team at Oracle manages 100% of the hardware that goes in and out of the company. Um, 
for the purpose of this presentation, infrastructure, buzzword infrastructure, really refers to the operating system and operating environment and all the hardware that's underlying it. And I'll be discussing the hardware underlying piece. Uh, just like um, the design principles for our operating systems were um, getting, of course, a lot of security, a lot of features to be added, and a lot of automation uh, to make the pain of dealing with operating system as least as is possible. In hardware, we strive to build one common platform by which all of our properties run, whether they're public cloud, private cloud, on-premise, cloud at customer, all of that. One common architecture. And for that, we have design principles that really compose of security, foremost, reliability, and uh, performance. And I'll be touching on those three for you. Now, the same principles withstand regardless of the deployment model. Same architecture, same operating system, same hardware, same firmware, same bits, if you will, same mistakes. Once we find a mistake in a place, an issue, it's kind of resolved for all. So you may not be our public, cust uh, public cloud customer, but you get benefit of having that group of machines act in a certain way, find issues, fix it, whatever they may be, and you get the benefit down the line. Or you could be a customer that kind of mixes and matches it, and that also is great. So that's really the leverage that we um, take advantage of. We kind of started on that leverage with Exadata, where we had one common hardware base, one common software base, and many, many customers used it exactly the same way. We're kind of taking that principle and extending it across all compute, storage, and networking, everything that we're doing, regardless of any business model delivery. So talk about that, the security, the foremost piece. A typical hardware supply chain looks like this. You have a bunch of discrete components, resistors, capacitors, diodes. You have kind of higher level subsystems like maybe a disk, disk drive or a flash drive. And of course, there's some designs that are leveraged from different manufacturers. And then they come into some external manufacturer. They get tested, fabricated, all that. And they get shipped out to somebody's cloud, somebody's data center, whatever. Unfortunately, every single pathway that one can think about in this flow has been impacted. This is not like something to worry about. It's something that actually has occurred industry-wide. So what we do at Oracle, we strive to basically close down all those possibilities by which, if you will, unintended bugs can get into system. And we do that with our people and our processes. And I can describe that to you. And it fundamentally comes down to owning the IP that we ship to our customers, whether, again, that could be cloud or on-premise, whatever. We own that hardware design. We own, and of course, not just own, but develop the firmware that goes with it. We have significant security audits, as Wim discussed, where, if you will, they are sister teams, and there are multiples of them that kind of inspect our designs from different perspectives that may not be familiar to designers. We have suppliers that we don't really run a reverse auction every Monday morning to see who's the lowest cost supplier for that week and do business with them. We have long lasting relationship with few suppliers that understand and adhere to our needs. Um, all the design that we actually transmit back and forth with our external manufacturers are encrypted and signed. So if you will, what we intended to be designed is what actually is delivered to our factories. Um, and of course, we have extensive quality testing certification that's kind of ongoing. And we're kind of doing spot checking all over the place. And the basics of it also is that all the firmware we design, it's all digitally signed. Those signatures are checked upon boot. So if you make a code change, it doesn't match the signature. You can still get to infect the system, but system will refuse to boot which is key. So it, you may somehow succeed to infect the system, but we're going to strive to make sure that system is not workable from your perspective. And of course, all of this comes together in integration centers that are highly regulated, highly controlled by Oracle, and make sure what we intended as a last stop is what um, is actually being shift, uh, shipped. Now, um, just like our hardware supply chain, we have a um, software supply chain, if you will. And uh, unfortunately, that's also been attacked and kind of made into a Swiss cheese as well. It could be basically bugs that you didn't intend to have in your source code. 
I know, buffer overflow or something like that. It could be infected libraries that you're picking up these designs that you think it's cool, it's easy, we can leverage it, and voila, there's a bug in there hidden for you. Remote execution is a big headache here. And of course, um, side channel data leak where you basically have architecturally two different VMs that are not supposed to see each other. But through hardware implementation mistakes, bugs, they get to see uh, maybe even impact one another. So those are the things we kind of strive to eliminate. Now, any standard block of a server um, is really composed of, the, at the heart of it is that host CPU, could be AMD, Intel, something like that, with the main memory. It has a service processor that basically watches over things to make sure everything is kind of being executed correctly. It has a networking stack, it has a storage stack, and all the firmware that goes with it. Any of these things can actually be impacted by malware, and that's what we kind of protect, try to protect against. I won't get into details of operating system, um, Vim covered that. So just like we have our own hardware design signed and delivered, we have our own firmware that's also signed and delivered. Those signatures, you can't just generate on your own. There's kind of, if you will, a secret to us. There are secret keys. So that path is kind of protected again. And then also all the manufacturers we deal with in terms of networking stack or storage stack, they also sign. So if that signature is not valid, the system refuses to boot. That's kind of a fundamental path that we create. And of course, if you're an on-premise customer, by default, out of the box, we deliver to you maximum security settings. So you have to really work hard to lower it, and hopefully you're not doing that. And then in addition to that, we do not allow host CPU to actually update any of the firmware. Our management processors are able to update if they have the appropriate uh, capability, the right, and have the signatures to actually go achieve this. So we kind of, if you will, enforce the principle of least privilege. So we, if you will, we trust you the least as opposed to most and see where we go from there. We take the same infrastructure of compute that may be used for our servers, used for our storage, also used for our networking, same fundamentals. When we take that to OCI, we add four distinct pieces. There's actually more, but I'm gonna discuss four distinct pieces we add. One is hardware-based root of trust. If you will, this is a hidden microcontroller that is not visible to any customer, that watches over everything that's going on in the system, and ensures we are doing a clean wipe of the system for the very first time in its life when it's being delivered from our own factories to our data center, we do not trust that path, even though it's under our control. We reinitialize that system to where we think it should be. And then once the customer takes that machine, they're a fresh golden start, if you will. When they're done, they return it to us. We rewipe using the same root of trust infrastructure. So going to the, from customer A to B, we still have a clean start. So whether it's the very first minute of life of a server, if you will, or it's a customer to customer switch, all starts are fresh, known to a clear state. In addition to that, all the data that comes in and out of these servers, again, it could be a server, it could be storage, whatever that may be, is encrypted and keys do not belong to us. So just like we like to protect customers against one another, we like to also protect our customers from Oracle itself, if you will, insider threat protection. So we're also making sure that, again, those keys are private to customer. We don't have access to them. We don't know what they are. So even if that if data is seen, it will not make sense to anybody except the customer who owns the keys. The third piece, which is very fundamental, is if you imagine, let's say we have a group of 100,000 servers, and we may have 10, 20, 50, 5,000 customers, kind of each creating their own virtual data center out of this collection of one large physical data center. How do we keep those customers away from each other and have each of them feel like everything they've got is theirs and nobody else exists in the world? We do that through what we call 
um, network layer virtualization. This is, if you will, a, a network processor that is, again, not visible to customer. It is not part of the architecture that the customer gets to see, very much like ROT. If you will, it's sitting off box. And it creates this uh, domain by which you, as a customer, believe you're not really seeing, you can't see anyone else except yourself and all the pieces that you've already purchased and own at any given time. As dynamically things shift, we change that programming. So that's kind of the, uh, if you will, off-box networking virtualization layer is fundamental for us to be able to achieve customer-to-customer -customer isolation, even though physical grouping is one of the same. Finally, we have many OCI data centers, many regions, maybe many availability domains, and all of them are encrypted. So a layer two attack won't be able to make sense out of things because everything is encrypted and the, you won't go very far with that. So uh, looking at every layer of the infrastructure, from the very bottom, hardware that's owned, developed by us, firmware that's owned, developed, signed by us, to our manufacturers we have a long-lasting relationship with, to all the pieces that Vim talked about, Oracle Linux, its automation, its case buys, um, hot servicing and all that, to all the things we do in terms of encrypting the data and all the services in OCI we provide for managing um, that infrastructure for you, to our database and all the security layers on top. So if you will, every layer doesn't necessarily count on every other layer. It makes its own independent goodness, uh, de uh, good decisions. But nevertheless, we, we cannot afford to have a weak link in this stack, if you will, in this chain. So we work in making every one of these layers highly secure. Reliability. Um, we use very high quality components. They are fully tested to our specification. Seldom they are the lowest cost components out there. Uh, we have comprehensive ongoing reliability testing out of our factories. So we don't just test for whether something boots and works well and go out, but we have ongoing reliability testing. We just make sure that the profile of what we ship to our customers, and again, customers could be our own data centers, is what we expect it to be. In addition to that, Within OCI, we have ongoing reliability monitoring. Just because we have access to hundreds of thousands of servers, we are constantly monitoring them. And we are finding, quite frankly, very corner case issues that's very hard to see if you are a customer of 100 servers or 1,000 servers. But when you have a collection of 100,000, 500,000, they kind of become more visible. That's what we strive to fix and make more reliable. So even if you're not an OCI customer, you get the benefit of that at cloud at customer, on-premise, and all that. And of course, going with our tradition of building highly resilient system, highly redundant systems, we have storage subsystems that are as such. We have power system, cooling system. Fundamentals of what we've got there also are made highly reliable. And highly reliable for the sake of our customers, but also highly reliable for our own sake too, because we want to lower the burden of managing all of this. And of course, all of this is, there's additional level of uh, availability that's made available or made possible uh, because of our operating system, because of our database layer, all kinds of other stuff we've going on in OCI that, again, I won't get into today. Finally, performance. Um, hopefully by now you've heard about Exadata X8M. Maybe you haven't. That's probably because you checked in like two hours ago or something like that. It should have been everywhere. Um, it's a significantly faster machine, two and a half times faster, 10 times lower latency than a machine we introduced six months ago. This is not comparing to a machine from five years ago. We strive to create the highest performance bundle we can in any of our deployment models. In this particular case, the Rocky technology, which basically is a 100 gigi based technology that lets you remotely manipulate memory of another server, in this case, all bundled under Exadata, coupled with the Intel Flash technology that allows us to do writes to memory system that are permanent. The two together allow us to get to these performance levels that we are discussing. And 
some people ask, it's too fast. I don't need this. So I like to remind those kinds of customers of two things. As um, Larry likes to talk about, high performance can translate to low cost. So if you're running twice as fast, maybe you can buy half as much and save money through the performance. The other one that's probably more interesting is you actually get to do more. You can get to do more fraud detection. You can get to do more personalized shopping for your customers. There's so much you can do, and hopefully you attempt to do that, and we do enable all of that. So end of the day, however amazing is a performance of a database machine in memory, we are actually creating that with a distributed storage system that has all the scalability, all the benefits, all the redundancy that you can have with just a single node in memory subsystem. Pretty good. We take the same networking technology, 100 gig RDMA, and apply it to our OCI cluster compute. So if you are a customer and you're buying multiple nodes from us, we allow you to connect at a one and a half microsecond latency between these nodes, quite, quite fast. So you can kind of build your own cluster that is generally good for high performance computing. And high performance computing, of course, can be applied to many, many aspects of life, from manufacturing to medicine discovery, all that. We take the same networking design, same compute, same storage. We bundle it in this thing we call PCA, or public cloud appliance. And we get to offer it in two different deployment models. At a cloud at customer, we call it PCC. At an on-premise purchase, CapEx purchase, if you will, it's a PCA. It's the same identical hardware. Nearly same identical software with two different management models, two different business models, and the delivery of the service to you, you get to choose. But all of this is kind of highly leveraged. Finally, um, if you remember nothing from today, I'd like you to remember that um, the innovation at Oracle for infrastructure is very significant, whether it's at server, storage, or networking, or whether it's our operating systems and operating environments. We are kind of keep pushing that edge. And then this infrastructure is really a foundation of everything we do across all business models we deliver. So highly, highly leveraged of any issue found is fixed everywhere. That's what we uh, promise as what we deliver for you. Uh, quite unique, we believe, in the industry. So that basically lets us have an engineering team that's all under Oracle umbrella that really strives for this maximum security, maximum performance, maximum reliability. Thank you.